Ephesians 3, the verses that we're going to focus on is 17 and 18, but we're going to start reading at verse 14. Let's first say a short prayer. Lord our God, thank you for your word. Please send us also your spirit so that as we read it, as we reflect on it and meditate on it, that you would speak to us according to what we need to hear so that we can grow in our love for you and our understanding of you. In Jesus, amen. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And that's our passage for today. So rooted and grounded, that's the kind of the theme, the focus here. And it talks about that in, uh, in verse 17 there, being rooted and grounded in love. So rooted, the Bible likes pictures. Yeah, you know, if you read the Bible, you, there's lots of pictures in there. So, so rooted is another one of these pictures. It's an agricultural picture, okay? Trees grow and they produce roots. And if you do gardening, weeds grow and they produce roots and you got to weed them out. And sometimes it's really a pain to weed them out because of the root system. But here's a picture of a tree here. And look at the roots there. The roots go farther than even the branches do. And they go as deep as it is tall, maybe even deeper. So look at, look at the roots. Being, being rooted is this sort of a picture here. And one thing that rooted means is that you're not going to blow away. Okay, a wind blowing this tree is going to be firmly settled and, and rooted because of the roots. It's not going to blow away. We have, a, we have a tree by the parsonage. And uh, it's, it's just off the edge of our, our back deck there. And when some thunderstorms come in, it can have a lot of gusty winds. And uh, that tree has, has blown pretty far over in some winds. But it hasn't blown all the way over because it has good roots. Same, same for you and me. We, we blow in the winds of, of time. And so we needed to be rooted in God's Word and what He says so that we won't just be blown away and blown here and there by everything that we hear. Look at, the, look at this passage here, Ephesians 4, the next chapter. It says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, look at this, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And there's, there's a lot of charlatans out there who are peddling their ideas, and they have large followings, and we need to be rooted in what God's Word says. So we're going to be rooted. Um, but rooted also means that uh, you're getting nutrients for your survival. You know, the, the trees, they need sunshine, but they also, need, they also need the water and the moisture that's, that's in the ground for its survival. And there's lots of nutrients in the ground that these trees get too. So being rooted doesn't just mean you're not going to blow away. It, it also means you are grounded and, and rooted. Boy, this is, uh, your, your, your hands are in the things that you need. How about that? You're getting the nutrients for your survival. We said this in the litany a moment ago, but I'm going to put it in front of you again. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. 
And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. So if you are grounded in what God says, it says the law of the Lord, but it's basically all of God's instruction. If you're grounded in that, you're getting all of those nutrients for your survival and particularly for your spiritual survival. So rooted is an agricultural picture and then it says grounded. This is an architectural picture. And uh, thanks to Scott Balcamp for this picture here. This is, this is uh, some foundations that are going to be laid. And I have that red circle up there so you'll notice how deep it goes. You have to dig really deep for a foundation of, of a house. In fact, it's, uh, in Michigan, it's 42 inches deep that you need to be so that the frost doesn't get on or underneath your foundations and make make the ground kind of buckle and move and, and up and down and stuff. I don't, uh, I don't understand all of that, but uh, I know a lot of you do. So we'll just leave it there. But, but uh, grounded is, is this. It means you have a foundation. You're not, you didn't just throw some sticks of wood together and call it a house. You have to dig deep to have a foundation. So you're grounded Grounded means you're a house with a foundation. Okay? So when it says rooted and when it says grounded, grounded means you are a house with a foundation. It's dug deep into the earth so that the frost and other things will not make your house bend up and down or other things like that. If you don't have a foundation, your house will start to sink. The ground shifts over time. And certain parts of your house will go like this, and other parts will go like that. And then your house will start to crack in half. Okay. So it says you're rooted and grounded, but what does it say we are rooted and grounded in? Okay, there's lots of good things to be rooted and grounded in. Um, But this says here that you are being rooted and grounded in love. Grounded in love. We need something good to be rooted in, and this says we're grounded in love. Okay, but what kind of love are we talking about here? English is kind of a a bad language for the word love. There's lots of kinds of love out there, and other languages have different ways of saying it. Are we talking about romantic love? Are we talking about family love? Are we talking about the love for your pet? Or the love that you have for ice cream? I mean, what kind of love are we talking about? There's lots of different kinds of love. This love in the Greek here is is, um, agape love. That's the Greek word for it. And this kind of love is is a special kind of love. It's it's agape love, and I'll explain to you what that means here. Um, But uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Hit the next one there. And the passage, good. This is Jesus saying, A new commandment that I give you, that you love one another. Okay, here's a key. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Okay, agape love is basically loving as Jesus loved. Okay? Jesus left his heavenly throne. He became mortal And not only that, but he lived to serve, and then he died on a cross before he was raised to life and now is ascended at the right hand of the Father. This is love, all right? So agape love is to seek the benefit of others. That's God's love. That's Christ's love. That's the love that we're talking about here. We're rooted in this love, seeking the benefit of others, okay? Ephesians 5 verse 2 Uh, there we go. And it says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We're supposed to give our lives to serve one another. That's what we're supposed to do. So agape love is Christ's love. It's Christ's love. 1 John 4, 10, and 11. 
This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, that's like payment or covering, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So the idea here is that when you know Jesus Christ, when you understand the sacrifices that he made for you and me, that you would be so moved and so inspired by that, that you would love as he loved. That's the idea. All right? When you have been saved by his grace and his sacrifice on the cross, that that would change you. And that you would look at life differently. You would look at yourself differently. You'd look at others differently. You'd look at your day-to-day tasks differently. And that you would live a life not for yourself, not just for the weekend, not just for the day-to-day pleasures that you might enjoy, but for eternal purposes, and that of loving as he loved. That's the idea. We are rooted and grounded, actually, in Jesus himself. This was what his, his whole life was about. So we're rooted and grounded in love, but Rooted and grounded in love means being rooted and grounded in Christ, who is the definition of love. He's the definition of agape love. So Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And then look at this. Rooted and built up in him. Same same word pictures there. And established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Okay, so we are, notice it says walk in him. It doesn't say walk with him, it says walk in him. Like you're a part of who he is. So we walk in Christ. We walk in him. We are rooted and grounded in Jesus himself to the point where we are one with him. Okay? And only in Jesus are we saved from our sins. This is, this is the first principle here, okay? If you're not saved from your sins, then all of this, all of this is, just, is just window dressing, right? Um, only in Jesus are we saved from our sins. Hit the next slide there. Only in Jesus. Why don't you hit uh, the next one there? Let's answer this together. Why do you say that by faith alone you are right with God? It is not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. So, Without Jesus, we've got nothing. It's his satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness that make us right with God. Apart from him, we are God's enemies in sin. With Jesus, we are children of God. So that makes all the difference in the world. Everything else, everything else is contingent upon this. So we need to make sure we get that in there. Okay, so we are rooted and grounded in Jesus. We're rooted and grounded in him in at least five ways, right? We'll just talk about five today. We could probably break these down into quite a bit more if we wanted to, but let's just settle on these. Number one is knowing the Bible. You need to know what God's word says. And when you read the Bible, we're going through this as a, as a senior high Sunday school class too. When you go through the Bible, don't just... Don't just read it like a textbook. Read it to get to know who Jesus is. That's what the Bible's for. It's to tell us who Jesus is and what it means to be saved in him. So know your Bible. Not just reading it, but knowing it. And knowing the one who's behind it. Jesus is God speaking to us, and that means that truth is a person. Truth is a person. And this book reveals that person. 
The Bible reveals Jesus to us. So knowing the Bible, when you're reading the Bible, you are engaging with Jesus. You are rooted and grounded in him. That's number one. Number two is prayer. When you're praying, you pray in Jesus' name. That's kind of a common way to wrap up a prayer. Or in Christ's name, something like that. When you pray that way, you are communing with him in heaven with the Father. Prayer is a tremendous thing. We talked about how if you're like a part of Jesus, you're rooted and grounded in him, and you're like one with him. And if you're one with him, that means that currently, in a spiritual way, you are sitting in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. And when you pray, you are praying in Christ to the Father who's right there. You don't have to shout up into the sky to pray to God. He's right there. You can just talk to him. Prayer is a magnificent thing. And when you pray in Christ, you are praying in heaven, seated next to the Father. This is a wonderful privilege. A wonderful way to, to know the Lord. So the Bible is God talking to us. Prayer is us talking back to God. If you know somebody, you, you need to interact with them. All right? You interact with your friends, your family. We interact with each other. You interact with God too. He talks to you through the word. You talk back to him in prayer. We talk back and forth. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. When you pray, you're not just speaking empty words. God is actually hearing you and listening. Number three, this one I think gets overlooked a lot, but sacraments, okay? We have here the Lord's Supper and we have baptism, okay? Um, I point this out to people making profession of faith, but the way that this sanctuary is set up is supposed to tell you something. So behind me, there's a cross, which represents Christ, right? So we are all facing the cross. When you come here, your focus is on who Jesus is and what he's done, right? Okay, now how do we get there? We get to Christ through the word, which is from the pulpit, and the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Okay, the word and sacraments go together. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these are not symbols. It's commonly mentioned that they are symbols, but they're not. They're sacred. They're sacraments. Something sacred is going on here that we can't fully understand. They're sacraments. Look at how Peter describes this here. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just say repent. He says repent and be baptized. And then, why we baptize infants? The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Repent and be baptized. This is... This is Sacred stuff. And for the Lord's Supper, more than a symbol. Why don't you hit the next one there? More than a symbol, the cup of bless. Oh, back up. There we go. Thank you. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? When we partake of the bread and of the cup, we are partaking in his body and blood. It's more than a symbol. It's a sacrament. Something sacred is going on here. So, knowing the Bible, prayer, sacraments, fellowship of believers. The fellowship of believers. This is important. Being part of a body of believers is critical to your walk with the Lord. Because it describes the fellowship of believers as Christ himself on earth. Okay? You can't, when you need a hug, you know, Christ isn't physically here, 
where you could hug him, but lots of people here could give you a hug. And, and I'm not the kind of person who will usually initiate a hug, maybe on a couple occasions, but not usually. But if you want a hug, I'll give you a hug. Doesn't, doesn't bother me. If you want a hug, just ask. I'll give you one. Because we all need hugs, and we need hugs from Jesus. Not just any old hug. We need a hug from Jesus. And when you get a hug from one of your fellow believers, this is Jesus hugging you. We are the hands and feet of Christ. Look at uh, what it says here. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Okay? Fellow believers, when we hug each other, we're getting hugged by Jesus. When we shake each other's hands, give each other encouragement, that's Jesus interacting with us. Look at how Jesus describes this. And falling to the ground, he, that's Saul, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Saul was going around and, and trying to throw Christians in jail. And Jesus says, you're persecuting me because these people, these believers, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And number five living in love as he loved. You know Jesus and you're grounded in him when you live as he lived. It's one thing to hear about Jesus, to know about him, to know what he did. It's quite another thing to do the things that he did. If you want to understand somebody, you live as they lived. You walk as they walked. Look at this. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That means fellow believers. Okay? We lay down our lives for each other. Which means we give our time. We give our resources. We give a listening ear. We give our, our energy and our hands to help. One more. Philippians 3 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's like Paul is saying here, I want to walk in Jesus' shoes and his footsteps. I want to lay down my life for other people because he rose from the dead and I want to understand that. I want to know that. I want to live that. Anybody want to die? That's basically what he's saying. But that's what Jesus did. Not just abstractly, but because he loved. When you love, you give yourself. Here's what I'm trying to say here. Only when you love as Christ loved do you realize the breadth and length and height and depth of his love for us. If you're just receiving love, you won't understand that. But when you try to love others, you realize just how difficult it is to love us. When you experience yourself the hope and effort to benefit somebody else, somebody that you care about, when you want what's best for this person, and you experience the sacrifice that it takes to benefit this person. You give of yourself, your time, resources, whatever, and you give that to somebody else. And then you see them reject your help or get angry for interfering or seeing them fail again and again and feeling that anguish again and again and that disappointment again and again. When you love somebody else, that's when you realize how amazing God's love is for us. Because how we fail the Lord again and again, we turn back to sin again and again when we know better. You see them destroy themselves and you are trying to love them. Only then do you realize the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love for you despite your sin. And for me, love as he loved. And you will know how much he loves us.
Romans 5 verse 8. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's easy to be nice and love good people, people who work with you. It's quite another thing to love sinners. Okay? That's what we're called to do. Last thought for you. Be rooted and grounded by loving others as Jesus loved. And then you will know Him. And you will be firmly rooted and grounded in who He is. You will understand Him and you will get all the nutrients for a strong spiritual life. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Your Son. Lord Jesus, we thank You for coming into this world. Help us to, help us to love as He loved to be firmly grounded and rooted in who He is. Through the Word, through prayer, through sacraments, through the fellowship of believers, and through loving as He loved. Lord, teach us and build us up in who Jesus Christ is. And we pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.